Painter Chuck Close famously said, inspiration is for amateurs. The rest of us just show up and get to work. Most people think that finding inspiration is hard, but the truth is that having the stamina to keep showing up to make your art is harder. If you do that, the inspiration will come. Welcome to the Passionate Painter Podcast. I'm your host, Caroline Italia Carlson. Whether your art is a full-time career or your side gig, if you are passionate about creating art, this podcast is for you. Don't worry about taking notes. I'll do that for you. And you can find them at passionatepainterpodcast.com. Today, I'm happy to bring you an interview with mosaicist Joseph Kafton. Joseph was born in northeastern Wisconsin. His mother was a newspaper photographer and his father a self-taught mosaicist. Encouraged by his parents, Joseph began drawing and painting at a young age. He later studied art at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and graphic design at American University. He worked as a graphic designer, his favorite projects creating CD and book covers. In 2006, he began his first mosaic as a way to engage with his father, who had suffered a stroke. He connected with the experience, but after his father's passing, the mosaic was not finished until 2012. While completing this work, Joseph fell in love with the medium all over again and began making mosaics in earnest. His work is fueled by the way glass holds and reflects light and its ability to express translucence, especially when it's used to suggest water, fish scales, or bird feathers. Searching for the iconic and sacred in the everyday, Joseph is looking for the most fundamental stories of nature, and it is these interactions that excite him to make mosaics. Inspired by water touching land and waves meeting sky, Joseph spends as much time as he can teaching kayaking, snorkeling, fishing, foraging shellfish, and walking the beaches. Joseph makes his home and studio in Seattle on the Puget Sound, and in Wisconsin at his cottage on Lake Michigan. Hi, Joe. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Oh, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to talk to you again. Now, are you back in Seattle? I am, yep. Did you jump right back into your artwork when you got back, or did you take some time off? I just got back and uh, last night, and I am renovating my studio, cleaning it up, the deep cleaning it deserves. Oh, great. And then tomorrow I'll jump back into cutting glass. But um, I'm daunted and excited for this process because I look around and it's so, so prime for reorganization. It's going to be glorious. Yeah, I know how you feel. With my studios, um, I've had so many different kinds over the years. And there are times where you just feel like you have to stop everything and clear the deck. Yep. And my Wisconsin studio, my studio at my cottage in Door County, is simply a table in a beautiful room that I set up over an hour when I arrive and I clean up over three hours when I leave. And it's in a, it overlooks the lake and it's stunning, but there's something to not being able to leave everything out all the time that just isn't as just as satisfying as this studio in my garage in Seattle. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that 100%. And it took me a long time to be willing to take up space with my art that I realized in order to be consistent, I needed to leave my stuff out. I needed to walk through the room and smell the oil paint. Yeah. And I mean, it's just out and it's wet and I've got a palette going and I've got one or two paintings up. And at any point, I just jump in and I, I do a few strokes if I feel like I just want a quick, it's hard to pull myself away. So I try not to do that because then I tend to be late for wherever it is I'm going. Huh. But the key is... I love that. It, it's, I have to have my stuff set up, and I've told other artists the same. You've got to take up space. You've got to be willing to say, I need this. Yeah. I, I think it was the number one priority when I moved to this house was a, a comfortable, permanent space for my work. Yeah. Yeah, that's how I pick out houses, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was my first time. It is? Yeah. That's how I do it. Well, at... at picking out a house because of that because I've only been a mosaicist for about seven years now okay yeah I've got my husband trained now we if we walk through it we've moved a lot of times we met in California and then we have relocated to the Midwest where we are now and um, nice. yeah it's it's beautiful and when we do move 
uh, I can hear him walking through the room saying, this could be a studio. <laughs> <laughs> That's got to feel good. Oh, yeah, it's necessary. Tell me about your background and how you got started in creating your art. Well, I was lucky enough to be born into a fairly creative family. My father was an attorney, but on the side, he made wood carvings every summer, uh, telephone poles that he carved into Greek gods or um, abstracts. And he also made mosaics uh, a couple every year. My mom was a newspaper photographer before she was married. And then throughout my whole childhood, she had us doing creative projects all the time. And, you know, it was just second nature that if you weren't doing anything, you were drawing or, or you know, cutting paper or doing something. So when I went to college, it was pretty obvious that I would want to study art. Although I ended up, I did end up studying psychology. Uh, I also did a minor in art and then I went back to school and studied graphic design. So then I became a graphic designer and time passed. My mom passed and my dad was in his 90s and he was still making his mosaics. And sadly, he had a stroke and a surgery and he couldn't move half his body. And um, I spent about half of the year with him and I wanted to do something that would keep his attention and his interest. So I got out all his mosaic materials and uh, I found a frame he had and the glass, which was called Smalties from Italy and his cutting tools. And I drew my house in Seattle on the frame. And together we just sat there and I just placed the glass and tried to make a, you know, a, a painting of, uh, of the, my house uh, with his materials, his glass, while we just talked. And it was a lot of fun. And he, he was engaged in it and we both enjoyed it. So that finished in a few months. And then I um, started another one, uh, a photograph of a bunch of kayakers on the water. And it was a bigger one. And we got halfway through and he was uh, in his mid 90s and he passed away. And um, it was pretty emotional. So I put the half finished mosaic in the basement at the cottage and didn't think about it for a long time. And about six years later, I went into the basement, I saw the mosaic. And I thought, well, uh, I might as well finish it. So I got out his glass and I got out his tools and the mosaic and I finished it. And I, I thought it was f fun and I, I enjoyed it and it felt good and I felt connected to my dad. So I put it on the wall, but then I started looking online to see where I could get more materials or if anybody was making mosaics. Turns out there, there was a major mosaic purveyor shop in Pulaski, Wisconsin, not far from our cottage. So I went there and I met a wonderful woman named Kim Wozniak, who showed me the best tools. My father never had the best tools for cutting and the different kinds of glass. And I made an another mosaic and uh, I showed a friend on my phone these mosaics and she's like, that's fantastic. I'm putting together a show of um, mosaic artists in the region. Would you like to be a part of it? And I was a little shocked because I was a fine graphic designer, but as an artist, nobody ever asked me to be a part of a show. So I did that and I made a couple more mosaics and a few of them sold and I was off and running. And that was about 2012. So I've been at it for about seven years and I'm madly in love with it. Wow. Well, it shows in your beautiful work. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. So... Joe, who, who would you say are your biggest influences? If you're, you know, you're coming from an art background yourself, do you have influences that caused you to, other than your background with your dad, was it really that that brought you into the mosaics? Or was it also, say, a love for impressionism? Do you have any of that leaning? Or is it just simply uh, something that meant a lot to your dad to get started with? Well, for me... Um, obviously, because my dad was a mosaic artist and I'm a mosaic artist, he is an influence. But I feel the greatest influence for me as an artist was my mom mm. and how she shared her her painting. But mostly she shared her eye and she shared her love of color and light. She used to have these colored prisms that she would uh, adhere to the window and we would see things going by distorted in yellows and greens. And she also had these little plastic boxes that she brought back from MoMA in New York, back when clear colored plastic was 
a new thing. And she had a, a series of bottles on a shelf behind a window and the way the light came through. I think all of that influenced me just to love light and to think about light. And um, and I really think it's her that I'm I'm sort of channeling when I sit down to make a mosaic. But of course, I'm influenced by impressionists. You can see that in my work. Yes. When I was younger, definitely. But as I got older, I realized over time that I was aware of the mosaics of Marc Chagall. I'd seen his four seasoned mosaic in Chicago. And it always stuck in my mind that somehow he made glass look like paint. Oh. It looked like it was paint on a white canvas. And although I've never attempted anything like that, that concept of glass looking like paint stuck with me. And as soon as I started making mosaics and after the third or fourth mosaic, I left my father's style, the traditional sort of geometric style of the Greeks and the Romans. I left that behind and I started cutting glass as if they were brush strokes. And I realized that I was thinking about Van Gogh. Yeah. I was thinking about Van Gogh paintings as I was cutting the glass and making waves on the water or clouds in the sky. So I think that was a huge influence. And then there's no question that Mark Rothko and the way he used colors to harmonize was a big influence on me. Yeah. And can I just add that those were some monumental influences, but as an artist, uh, especially working in Door County, I've got some what I call friend mentors, and I would love to just yeah. thank them for supporting me and helping me and guiding me as an artist. Uh, names like um, a painter, glass artist, Stephanie Trenchard, a glass blower, Jeremy Popelka, collage artist, Bruce Bosch, and, and especially my sister, who's a pastel artist, pastel painter in Door County, Nikki Kafton. So thank you for letting me mention those. Of course, that's wonderful. And your work does evoke uh, visions of Van Gogh's work. With I can tell that you switched over to the brush stroke theory when I looked at your pieces because Van Gogh does come to mind because of the play of light. And even uh, pointillist painter George Seurat mm. in that when you get up close. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's small shapes and it's abstract almost. But when you back up, you see the full picture. You can't blend the medium. It's glass. Right. So you have to cause it to be blended in the eye. And that's exactly where I got that idea from or realized that was possible with Soro. Wow. Mm -hmm. And how did you establish yourself with galleries? Um, well, of course, I went to some websites and I followed their guidelines and that worked out well. But I also uh, I've always felt my work belonged in tourist communities, in galleries, in tourist communities. So I went to a few and I just walked around with a mosaic. And one gallery, I walked in the door. It was empty except for the owner, the gallerist, was on the phone. He turned around, he looked at me, he saw this chicken mosaic in my arms. He put his hand over the phone and yelled, yes. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> so that was, that was a wonderful success story. But Shortly after that, I found myself in Kauai and I walked around. I know Kauai has all these chickens everywhere. I walked around with a chicken mosaic and so many of the gallerists were not interested. Really? But right before I left, I walked into a gallery. When I pulled the rooster mosaic out of the bag, she laughed and said, oh, I hate chickens. They wake me up in the morning. They poop everywhere. And you can't help but hitting them with your car every once in a while. And that's a mess. And I said, oh, well, um, what do you think of chicken art? She said, I hate chicken art. I'm never letting another damn chicken into my gallery. <laughs> so I started oh. to put the chicken in the bag and walked away feeling defeated. And she said, hey, do you do any fish? And I'm like, well, I'm, I, I, I do fish. I think of myself largely as a fish artist. So that worked out very well. And that was a delight. <laughs> I continue to do that. It is. It just is a good fit. <laughs> that's an awesome story. And that's very insightful of you to go to tourist venues to look to exhibit your art. So what I always do is I target the mosaics for the region, meaning like I did warm water fish in Hawaii. I do trout in Wisconsin. I uh, don't have landscapes with mountains in Wisconsin, but I do in the Northwest. So the tourist towns are... Are, are wonderful 
fit for me and they all have their own unique sort of vocabulary. Yeah, it's a good fit and it's a smart business move to to gravitate in that direction because you've got qualified buyers there. If they're tourists, they have some money to spend, they're looking to have a memento of their trip and they may not be sick of chickens or fish. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I've, I've seen the scope of your subject matter. I have to tell you, um, personally, I'm obsessed with the chickens, but that's, that's me. Um, I'm an animal rescue person. I, yeah, I, I might have stolen a chicken in college, but um, <laughs> I, yeah, I, it's a long story. I, I sort of got permission, but it was one of those, if somebody asks, I'll deny it. So you better hide the chicken and get it to rescue her. Anyway, sometimes in life, you got to steal a chicken. You got to stand up for the chickens. I'm telling you. And I did. It took me three weeks of smuggling her through the dorms. Wow. Um, But yeah. But on a legal note. So how do you seek out new opportunities? Um, Well, first off, I try to never say no to an opportunity, a business opportunity or or a creative opportunity, unless I have an extremely good reason. And I try to talk to as many other artists as I can and find out how they're making things happen. I just um, went to my very first festival and uh, first opportunity for me to stand next to my art, speak about it and to see how people responded to it. And that seems incredibly important to connect with people, to talk with them about your work. And uh, I have a feeling that that can lead to opportunity as well. Yes, I agree with you. That's very important to connect with your buyers and get used to speaking about your art with them because that connection, that human connection is really what it's all about and why people buy art for the most part. I mean, unless they're buying wholesale to resell, you know, your your buyer off the street that sees you, your work hanging in a gallery is going to want to know about you. Absolutely. And I made it a promise to myself that I would be present all day long to share myself fully with whoever wanted to. And I have to say it was one of the most impactful experiences of my life. Was it? It truly was. Wow. I can imagine. Now, where do your ideas come from? Do you keep a sketchbook or do you just look at local imagery? Yeah, looking, looking and seeing and then noticing how that makes me feel. I try to be aware of um, subject ideas all day long. I take photos with my phone as notes. I am a kayak instructor, I'm a lifelong fisher, and I spend a lot of my time outdoors in the woods and the water, and that's where my inspiration comes from. And more recently, I've got a lot of good friends who have chickens (laughs) and who are growing vegetables, particularly beets, and so now that's a part of my work as well. So who knows what's next? Rabbits? Carrots? (laughs) Oh, absolutely. I I saw two of the beets at your show, and I absolutely love the beets. Oh, thank you. I, to be honest, I loved it all. If, if I had to pick one, I think I'd probably faint, but <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'd probably start with a chicken, but there'd have to be more. So how do you navigate the business end of the art world? Honestly, poorly. <laughs> so far, at least. Do you have a, a, like an art representative or do you just deal with gallery owners directly? I deal with gallery owners directly. I, it's something that I would aspire to, to have an art representative. Recently, I had an opportunity to attend a workshop about how to run business as an artist. And now I'm starting to incorporate the things I learned there. I I don't really think it's fun, but I am taking pride in sort of methodically building a structure for the business side of the art. And that involves things like keeping meticulous records, self-promotion. I'm sending postcards. I'm writing emails. I'm calling galleries. So I'm... I'm getting a handle on that, and um, I am really appreciating that part of the whole career, the whole experience. Yeah, it's definitely daunting to some people who really are focused on the creative end, but don't particularly like the other end. I would say that's got to be 95% of most artists. I think so. I think I'm really strange in that regard, probably partially because I've been in digital art and marketing through my day job for so many years that... I tend to be more logical, but I love to paint, but I look at it more like something I schedule so that I can get it uh, consistently done. I look at it very logically. And then when I, while I'm painting, I have just a fabulous time and I'm, I lose time. I, I can look up and it's dark out mm-hmm. when I started at 10 a.m. Yep. But then there's the other side of my brain where I 
I want to say I enjoy, but once I get rolling with the paperwork and the taxes and this and that, I can I can get into that for its own interest. I think I'm learning to do that as well. And and I think it's wonderful you have a background in that and that you can connect to that piece of it because we have to have it. And I do think there can be pride and pleasure in it. Yes, I agree. And I had heard something recently from another artist who said, I can't recall who said it, but it was really just a comment that the most important thing for an artist to be is organized. Mm -hmm. And I think that saves a lot of time and stress because, for example, with regard to taxes, if you don't have a system, even if it's a simple one, I have an accordion file. I mean, I, I do my taxes online or arrange them online for an accountant, but I have an accordion file that's separate from the house for deductibles and the tabs are already labeled. So if I have something for printing out flyers or paint or brushes, you know, it goes into that file as I go. And I think that knowing where your stuff is and having it when you need it is the biggest time saver because as Marie Forleo says, everything is figure outable. <laughs> You can ask people the big questions, right? You can you can look it up. You can Google it these days. We're so fortunate. But if you need to come up with your own records and have yourself the one providing answers for someone else, trying to stay organized as you go to prevent those fire drills is really helpful, especially if that tends not to be your thing, the paperwork. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think if you wanted a new job, a side job, you could go around organizing the business side of ours because it sounds like you really have it thought out. I have thought about it. Yeah. Thank you. I have thought about it, but I just, I tell you what, all I want to do is get back in, in front of my easel these days. That's all I think about. Fair enough. So what's your biggest struggle in making your art? Well, obviously, as we talked about, the money is a huge challenge. But for me as an artist, it's this desire I have to move from making beautiful work to making really impactful work. Working that art festival, as I mentioned, gave me this incredible opportunity to see people react to my work. And some of them, a handful of them, each day walked up to me and told me that they were deeply moved by my work. And Honestly, I want more of that. And I also want to grow the level of complexity and quality in my art. I know it's not easy to define that, but I know it when I see it. And I want to challenge that and I want to grow it. I've been questioning whether I should incorporate more concept into my work. Like, you know, I'm often portraying landscapes, water, the environment. So should I be including an environmental statement, a political statement? But I'm just not sure if that's how I get better or if that's actually who I am as an artist. So these are things that I, I, I struggle with. I completely understand. I, I have struggled with that as well, trying to, you know, I've gotten hung up on, well, if I make this painting, it's got to be about something and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, what's funny when I was in college and I did my senior show, I'm a figurative painter and I love to paint portraits. And I was a college student, ergo, not a lot of money to spend. So I was the cheapest model I had and I would sit still for hours. So my senior show was all self-portraits and I was very surprised and really learned something when a woman came into the show and she looked up at one of the portraits and she said, I'm going to tell you what this is about. That's my mom and blah, 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 blah. And she had a story. And I thought, that's really weird because that's me and you're looking at me. <laughs> but that's art. But that's art. And that's the beauty of it is as you continue to create and going through the act of making the art, I think that will be infused as your life changes directions or develops in different experiences. But even so, without a description underneath, people are going to walk up and put their own spin on it, too. And that's nice. Well, it is nice. That universality of it, I think, is so, so important. Yeah, I do, too. So how do you price your work, then? That's a tough one for all of us. Um, well, I have this sort of joke that I say, and it's my mosaics are twice as much as I could ever pay for them and half as much as I need them to be to make any kind of a living. <laughs> 
And although there's a lot of truth in that, I have established prices. And at first I did it with the help of the gallerists. Uh, they really helped me get a sense of what was appropriate. And now I uh, use the size of the mosaic, the material costs, the time involved, how old it is, and also, honestly, how much I want to keep it or not. I even um, more recently got out a tape measure and a calculator, mm -hmm. and I've discovered that most of the time, my mosaics come to about four dollars a square inch. Actually, like three eighty. I'd like to achieve four, but I think that's kind of funny to be able to um, calculate it that way as well. Yes, and I've, I I have heard many formulas, and you can definitely find formulas for calculating by the square inch, which has gotten me rethinking my own methods. But I think that's funny that you have different criteria that impact how the pricing comes out, yet you still seem to have averaged that $3 and change per square inch. Yeah, it's average. It's really, now, now I got to ask you, when you say how old it is, when it gets older, is it more valuable or are you saying, I got to get this out of here? That's a really good question. <laughs> Price go up or down? When it's older, it's either so valuable I can't let it go, or it's one I'm sad hasn't found a home yet, and I want to support that as much as possible, and I'll bring the price down in order to facilitate that. Sure. So, okay, what business advice then, with your background and experience of your own struggles, would you give to another artist? Honestly, quit. <laughs> Okay, that's not helpful. Quit art as, as a business, if you can, and do it on the side. It's got to be a calling and not a choice. Right. If you still want to be an artist for a living, then you're going to make it happen. You will figure it out. But I really believe you've got to have that internal drive. Like, it's not you if you don't make art. That's my feeling. Now, I might end up where I can't do it financially either, but I'm giving it my try. I recently met some young artists and they were just so clear that it's what they had to do with their lives. I had no question that they were going to be making art for the rest of their lives. And it was really inspiring. But that's why I've been thinking about it that way lately. Yeah. No, I get you. I, um, I was fortunate to be asked to give the graduating address when I graduated college, not for the entire school, but for my department, for the art department. And I thought, oh crap, what am I going to tell these people? These are people graduating with painting degrees, like me. I had a painting degree, art history degree, and I thought, what am I going to tell them that's going to inspire them? Good luck. And I thought about it, and actually what I ended up saying, which is true, was if you are sitting in this room, then it's not because you chose art, it's because art chose you. Exactly. And I went on from there and ended up with something inspiring to keep them going. But I think as artists, we all need that, uh, I'd say inspiration, but um, really the encouragement to keep going. The mandate. Yeah, if you feel it in your soul, I know for me, if I'm not creating, um, if I'm not doing my paintings, I'm, I'm not myself. And so I have to find a way to work that in. I have a friend who, when I'm having a hard time, his first question is, when's the last time you were working on a mosaic? Uh, and the answer always is, it's been too long. It's been a while. Yep. He just knows that I'm all right when I'm working. Yep, that's right. Now, if you could, if you could snap your fingers and own a work from another artist, any artist, past or present, who would it be? It would be James Terrell, the light artist. Ooh. I'd be happy to have one of his indoor installations. They're incredible. But if I'm getting anything I want, I'd want it to be one of his massive underground skylight installations or his sun veil installations where he lets the natural light come in to mix with his staged light. It's just breathtaking. Wow. I would expect you'd have to make sure you kept up on your dusting. <laughs> well, if I can have that, I probably have people, a maintenance crew taking care of that. Otherwise, you'd see lots of additional art infused floating around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that sounds amazing. All right. Um, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self at the beginning of your career, what advice would you give yourself? Draw. I'd say draw, draw. And I don't care if you think you can't draw, do it anyway. It will change how you see, it will change your mind, your brain, and it will inform you as an artist no matter what medium you approach or are working in. And honestly, that's good advice, I think, 
for everybody at any age. I agree. Do you still draw? Not as much. I'm speaking to myself in this answer as much as I am to anybody. I uh, I need to, but because I struggle with it so much, I tell myself that I don't need it, and I think that's that's just un- nothing but unwise. In what way do you struggle? I do not have strong hand-eye coordination, so painting and drawing are tough, but when I'm good with a camera and I'm exceptionally good in Photoshop, and I had no idea, but that somehow translates into cutting glass and working in glass as a mosaic artist, and somehow that just isn't impacted, and I'm incredibly grateful for that. I really think of working in glass as being like the primitive Photoshop. And that's a good point, because all the principles are still there. But I've seen your work, and I'm going to be the first to say I think you're wrong, because if you can handle all those tiny little bitty pieces of glass and not cut your hands off and come up with something gorgeous, you're pretty coordinated. Well, thank you. It's a different (laughs) process. It is. And I, I do believe I'm quite good at what I'm doing, but it is a struggle to draw. Nonetheless, I think it would impact me to have been drawing most of my life and to continue to draw as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. It's always an asset. I agree. (laughs) Sketchbooks, people, you hate to hear it, but I'm going to scream into the wind on that. So uh, I forgot to ask you on a technical level, how do you attach the glass to your support? Um, So they call the thing you, uh, you adhere to something, the tessera, and they call the thing you adhere to the substrate. So I, I, I use glue most of the time. I use weld bond glue, but at other times I put it into thin set and, other, and, and then I use grout. So there are various materials you can use, but it depends on what I'm doing and where it's going indoors, outdoors, that kind of thing. That's true. And I guess it, I, I would think that the, the, the thing that you choose to use as your adhesive would then also dictate the way the light's going to play through the piece. It does. Uh, a choice between using grout or not grouting and just using the weld bond is uh, incredibly impactful. And it's something I play with. And um, I had mosaics there that were grouted, not grouted, where the foreground was grouted, but the background wasn't the opposite. Um, I definitely play around and it always has to do with the light. Yeah. Have you attached your work to clear glass before or other colored glass so that the light shows all the way through? white glass. I had three pieces there. I've been working with making mosaics directly onto white glass and it's for the reason that light goes into the below the substrate and comes up through and it just makes it that much brighter. It's almost like a bright light. It's really really interesting and perfect for some subject matter, some mosaics, but not all. Yes. Yeah, that's really interesting because then it would dictate also where you would hang the art. I, I, absolutely. Naturally, you'd light it, but you would also possibly be hanging it in front of a window, which isn't something you normally would hang a, a traditional piece of art actually in front of a window, but that's the medium. That's right. But that would also depend on whether the glass was adhered to a, a wooden frame with a wooden background or just the glass had no background and the light could come through. But I did have both of those. I have been working in both of those recently. Wow. I was so transfixed by your work. I don't recall seeing them in particular, which ones, which ones were on the white glass? Uh, Well, there was uh, a heron, a butterfly and an orange trout. And I feel as if people didn't notice it as much as feel it. And that's just fine with me. Well, that's why I'm asking, because it's it's not that I didn't remember them, but I was kind of dazzled when I saw all the different pieces and then I would look and I had gone through the whole exhibit and then I would go back and discover another one that was there the first time. But I'd say, oh, I didn't see that one. (laughs) And there was more to look at. So uh, it was more a thing of being kind of a little overwhelmed visually where it was so pretty. It was was very attractive. Thank you. And I, I remember the heron and I remember the butterfly and the trout as well. So... It didn't occur to me that that's why, but the heron especially, I, I found really captivating. I'm, I like birds, I guess you can tell by now. Uh, me too. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Joe, tell me, why did you choose to work in stained glass and smalty glass? Well, 
just to back up and explain myself a little bit, the thing that you glue to something is called the tessera, and the thing you glue it to is called the substrate. And my father used sometimes our, the walls at our house as his substrate. That's how he got started by doing the backsplash in their kitchen. But often it would just be a piece of plyboard or, uh, plywood or a frame. And I was doing that, and his main two tesseras were sheet glass or stained glass, it's called, or Italian smalty. And both of them are quite beautiful in different ways. The sheet glass or stained glass has this translucent quality, and it's shiny and beautiful, and it does a wonderful job of expressing skin of a fish or the reflection of water or shiny feathers of a chicken. And smalty is the traditional glass used in Greek and Roman mosaics, and it's got this gravity, this thickness, this opaque quality that's just beautiful as well. And when I first started working with both of them, I was very excited to move on to work in ceramic tile, sea glass, stone, materials like that, even beads or plastic. But then I started to realize that I didn't want to move on until I was finished exploring all the things I wanted to do with sheet glass and smalty. And here I am seven years in, 360 mosaics, and I'm nowhere near ready to move on. I just think they're so compelling and captivating. So it'll be a little while. Wow, that's wonderful, though, because the more that you sink into it, the more there is to discover. Just like when a person is looking at your art, that's how it feels. It may be a lifetime. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel that way about painting. Okay, so tell me, is there a message behind your work? I guess I feel like because I spend so much time of my life in nature, on the water, in the woods, that I see these flashes of light and color on a tree or on a fish, well, I'd say especially fish, and it just blows me away. Sometimes seeing a moment like that can make me giddy or, or sometimes it could even make me cry but I want to share those moments that excitement I feel that love of those subject matters and especially the color and the light with anyone who wants to come and stand in front of my mosaics yeah because it's it's very um illusory to catch that light and to see that flash of beauty yeah yeah those mm-hmm Those frozen moments, those flashes that exist in all of our days, every day, that's what excites me. So, Joe, artists talk so much about, well, often I hear artists talk about, oh, I'm an introvert, I don't like to promote my art, or I don't like to sell, and there's the discussion about introvert, extrovert, and how each of those could work, or what I thought I invented the phrase, apparently not, ambivert because I'm a little of both. It depends on the circumstances. So do you consider yourself an introvert, an extrovert, or an ambivert? And how does that affect you in business? Do you, you know, do you do your own sales? Well, I think that's a very interesting question because I don't consider myself an ambivert. I think that I am absolutely an introvert, but I came up with a new label, which is I am a highly social introvert. And the way I think of that is that I just love spending time with people and I'm very comfortable spending time with people in my business, um, promoting my work. And yes, I do a lot of my own sales, but I only can recharge by being alone. And as an artist, I spend most of my day alone. And so I am recharging all day long as I'm doing what I consider to be my meditation, which is making mosaics. And then when I need to go and promote work or show up at a gallery, I'm ready to go. I'm yeah, fully I'm really charged your answer or whether I'm just socializing with your, friends. Your, uh, your label, it fits me better. So it was highly social introvert? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's me. Yeah. People who are other intro- other introverts look at me and are convinced I'm an extrovert. Extroverts don't recognize me as an extrovert. Right. But um, that's what I think it is. I love people, but I only recharge being alone. And I'm fortunate enough that my my vocation allows that. Yes, and I, I do the same thing. I love my studio time for hours and hours. But um, when it's time for me to go out and get a connection, I am ready. I'm ready to go seek that but I don't 
seek it in big parties or big raucous gatherings. I, I'd rather have one-on-one -on -one connection and have coffee and get into some really good conversation. Right on, exactly. Connection. I'm going to guess you, you probably are not a fan of small talk. No, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the same boat. I, I think it was E.M. Forrester that said, connect only. Sp spend your life connecting, whether it's with the trees or, the, or, or the, the sea or other people connect. And small talk might lead to that, but it's not. I agree with itself. you. So I'm going to put your contact information in the show notes, but do you have a preferred way for listeners to get in touch with you about your art? Well, I'd love them to check me out on Facebook and Instagram, and both of them, I'm Joseph Kafton Mosaics, and then my webpage is josephkafton.com. Joe, it's been really great speaking with you today. I really appreciate your time. Please keep in touch, and let me know what's developing in your beautiful mosaics. Oh, well, thank you, and I would love to. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. And mine as well. I'd love to talk to you again soon. This wraps up my interview with mosaicist Joseph Kafton. Join me next time for an interview with artist Mark Brueggemann. And if you're enjoying this podcast, hit the subscribe button and never miss an episode. Until next time, go make something. <laughs>